Welcome to episode three of Art History with Caroline Quintanar. Today we're going to go over three different things. Uh, in the news we're going to be looking at Stonehenge. Unfortunately it's not about discoveries uh, regarding the historical site. It's actually going to be talking about some kind of worrying uh, road work that's being proposed in the area. The Medieval Magazine is uh, taking a turn. We have some new things that are coming up, some big announcements, which I'll share with you today as well. And then for the Medieval Travel Destination, I've chosen Hales Abbey in Hales Church, which is located here in England. I'll be sharing with you the history of both those locations, how to get there, and some of the highlights that make them special. So let's see what's going on with the news. So last week we talked about Stonehenge, talked about some new results uh, that had come to light about the people who had possibly created the location. Unfortunately, Stonehenge this week in the news is not as positive and exciting. The site is actually in danger right now and I wanted to discuss this a bit further. Now I've been sharing some things from the Stonehenge Alliance, which is working to protect the site from a UK government planned road work, which will actually put this location and the archaeological sites in the area in danger. So the UK government is preparing to widen the road, the A303, and also to excavate an almost three kilometer tunnel that will go across the Stonehenge uh, World Heritage Site, which is about, about almost four, five kilometers wide. Um, just to remind you, Stonehenge is a World Heritage Site protected by UNESCO, and this goes against the World Heritage Convention. Now, so not only will it put Stonehenge itself in danger, it's actually going to put all of the different sites that are within the area in danger as well. So you can see the map here that I have displayed. It shows you the Stonehenge World Heritage Site boundaries, shows you the key archaeological monuments within the area, the current roads, what uh, land is uh, taken care of by the National Trust, what the new expressway will look like, and the tunnel. And you can see the proximity of the tunnel to Stonehenge itself is very alarming and is something that would put this particular site that's been there for 5,000 years in a very dangerous position. Now, apart from Stonehenge itself, you can see all the archaeological sites within the area that are related uh, to the site and to other moments of history as well. And all of those would be put in, in danger as well for this particular project. Now, um, if you're outside of the UK, you probably weren't aware of this. Um, but if you're in the UK, many people are aware as well. So I really wanted to bring this to everyone's attention. You can get involved uh, through petitions. I highly encourage you to go to the Stonehenge Alliance website, which you have the link below, for more information about what they're currently doing, um, what their work with UNESCO is doing, and how they're trying to combat this particular project. You can also find other information via the hashtags that they've been using which is hashtag, hashtag, excuse me, save Stonehenge and hashtag Stonehenge tunnel. Now, both of these you'll find information. Now, I've said it many times uh, before on my blog and in different interviews and uh, different posts as well. The only way we can save these places is if we do something about it. And when I say we, I mean you and me. That means sharing this uh, with a wider audience, making sure everyone within our networks is aware this is happening, petitions, um, making sure that uh, UNESCO knows that you have, uh, they're, you're supporting them, uh, making sure that uh, any petition that is around, you are signing that to voice your opinion against this particular project. Now. Uh, there's there are things moving forward um, to stop this, but it's not necessarily going to actually be stopped. So again, I please invite you to look at the website below in the description section for the Stonehenge Alliance. 
Um, there you can see um, kind of how, where this has started, where it's going, the different updates, and you can be a part of something which is protecting a historical site that is iconic, not only to England, but to humanity and worldwide. And it's been standing there for almost 5,000 years. So let's not put it in danger just for the convenience of shaving off a few minutes on our drive. So uh, with that, we're going to actually move on now and look at the new things that are coming out of the Medieval Magazine. So as I announced last week, our medieval travel issue is out. It's still available and you can still uh, subscribe to it or get your individual issue. Uh, but we have some new things that are actually happening uh, in September. So as of September, we are making the move to be a monthly magazine. So up until now, if you've been a subscriber, we've been doing it bi-monthly, which basically means every two weeks we're, sub we're publishing uh, the magazine and we're moving to monthly primarily because we want to maintain the quality of uh, the content that we're sharing with you and the quality of the design of the magazine. So the price will not change, the price will stay the same. Um, the content will double so we're looking at 80 plus pages each month of carefully curated medieval content. And we're really excited about this. So our inaugural first monthly issue will be coming out in September. And September's issue is going to be really big for various reasons. We'll be looking at autumn, some different uh, folklore uh, related to that, looking at back to school, kind of education in the Middle Ages. But we'll also be looking at the 10 years that Medievalists has existed. So the Medieval Magazine is uh, has branched uh, out of Medievalists.net, which is kind of like our, our mothership. And they've been around for now 10 years. So we're going to look back at... Uh, different articles, different milestones, and celebrate those phenomenal 10 years and where they've come from, where we are right now, and where we're moving forward to. Now, with that, uh, also we'll be offering um, a sale on our older magazine issue. So the magazine's been around now for about three years, and we're moving in a different direction with design, um, looking at different topics and things, but we're still very proud of our previous issues. So next week, uh, if you go to our website, www.themedievalmagazine.com, you'll see we'll be having a sale on our uh, older issues, uh, which will be uh, $1.99. So they're usually uh, $3.99 USD, and we'll have a sale on those for $1.99. So you can get your copy of some of our back issues, and enjoy some of that content as well. So let's move on and look at our medieval travel destination. So in the past two episodes, I featured some different locations in Spain. This week, we're looking at a location here in England with two very unique uh, buildings within the same area. So I've chosen our destination to be Hales Church and Hales Abbey, uh, both located just outside of Wickham in Gloucestershire here in England. So that's about two and a half hours driving from London. That's in the Cotswolds area. Um, so Hales Church, it's a small little chapel. Um, it's been there since the, the 12th century. What makes it really special are the 13th century wall paintings. Now it existed before the Abbey Complex, uh, which was actually founded in 1276 and then actually completed in 1277, uh, this particular little church is dated based on some records that are provided between 1139 and 1151. So let's first talk about the church and then I'll tell you a little bit more about the abbey. So I really would like to focus uh, 
more on Hales Church. Now, apart from it being a very picturesque uh, little building itself, it's nestled in a beautiful location uh, in the English countryside. So these uh, very beautiful rolling green hills and vast picturesque landscape, and it's nicely tucked into that um, just outside of, of Winchcombe. Now, as I mentioned, this particular church comes from the mid to, to late 12th century, it was in existence before the Abbey. And um, some of the records, as I mentioned, say that it was built between either 1139 and 1151. So we don't have a, the specific date, but we have at least that range to understand a little bit more. Now, the abbey itself was founded in 1246 and then later constructed in 1277. But the church came under the abbey's jurisdiction in 1248. So it was used as a place of worship for visitors, pilgrims, um, basically the lady, the public. They weren't allowed to go into Hales Abbey. So the services uh, for these particular people were held in this church. Now, what's great about this church is you kind of can see its evolution throughout history. And it's, it's tiny. It's quite small. So it packs a lot <laughs> into uh, such a small building. So there were some architectural changes that happened uh, when it came under the jurisdiction of the Abbey in the 13th century. Um, we have the Eastern wall uh, of the chancel. So it was reconstructed. They added a curvilinear window. Some of the Norman windows were blocked out. And then later some early English windows were added as well. Um, we have the, the font um, and the piscina were added at this time. And then um, the most spectacular thing about uh, this little church are the wall paintings. Because most medieval places that you go to now, the wall paintings are almost all uh, but uh, erased. And it's you don't really have a lot of examples of it available to see in person. Where Ch Hills Church is pretty much, I would say, fairly intact in comparison to many other places. Now, um, you can even see the impact of the Reformation, um, where they added a pulpit um, in 1606. Fortunately, the stone altar was smashed, and then it was replaced by a communion table. So unlike some other locations during the dissolution, which were completely destroyed, this little church itself was just adapted to what was happening within the times. So it did fall into ruin um, for a little while, obviously with the dissolution of the abbey and not really having anyone in the area to take care of it, it fell into disrepair. So it was restored in the early 20th century, unfortunately not to the best specifications to protect such things. The wall paintings were covered with wax and varnish, which actually trapped a lot of moisture, which is not good for wall paintings. But fortunately, in the um, early 70s, it was restored properly and more wall paintings were actually uncovered. So I've mentioned the wall paintings now four or five times and I have actually some pictures here of examples of kind of just different fantastic um, pieces that are still there. And again, as it's a functioning little church, there's you know, you don't have the security, it's not behind glass. So you can get very close and observe and really kind of soak in the history. It's absolutely fantastic. So we have some different scenes. We have uh, St. Christopher, um, who's uh, shown kind of wading through the water and holding miniature Christ, which is very typical. It's a typical um, image from the Middle Ages. There's also a non-religious scene, which is depicting a hunt. And um, we have a lot of different things in such a small area. So let me show you some of the images that I have that, um, that can show you what exactly is there. So in the half blocked windows, we have two saints. We have St. Catherine of Alexandria and St. Margaret of Antioch. Both of these uh, paintings are in very good condition despite what <laughs> the photo is showing you. You can still see quite a bit of detail. Majority of the paintings are still there and the color is still quite vibrant given the fact that they've been there for almost 900 years. 
You also have pictures of medieval uh, animals, so we have different griffins, uh, unicorns, um, someone which we could attribute to be an owl, maybe, we're not sure. There's also the heraldic arms of Richard, who's the Earl of Cornwall, who was uh, the founder of the Abbey, so this was added a bit later. Now the east window um, is from the 15th century and this actually comes from the abbey itself and it was moved over there later in um, the 18th century. So this is an original piece from the abbey that fortunately was saved and was added to, to the church for preservation. And finally, um, you have really interesting floor tiles and you can see uh, in the image here, the different tiles um, that comprise some different heraldry and then we have different images as well. Now these come from Hales Abbey also and they were saved during the dissolution of the monastery. So we're quite lucky that this was saved and wasn't lost as well uh, when the monastery was destroyed. So let's look over at the Abbey which is actually just a short walk away. So Hales Abbey is just a short walk away from Hales Church. It's a 13th century Cistercian monastery, and it was founded by Richard, Earl of Cornwall, who was the brother of Henry III, who was the King of England at the time. Now, the story goes that Richard decided to found this particular monastery after surviving a shipwreck, and he wanted to thank God. So Henry granted him the manor of Hales, and he settled it with the order of Cistercian monks. Now, he founded founded it in 1246, but the completion of the building was in 1277. Unfortunately, the abbey is now completely in ruins. We only have uh, a few different archways and a few different uh, remnants of the, the building itself. So you're not able to see it in all of its uh, majesty. Uh, we do have a lovely museum that's on site, thanks to English Heritage and the National Trust. So in the museum, you have more in-depth history about the abbey itself, uh, different remains uh, that exist still. And you can learn more about the abbey and then walk around the ruins itself. Now, you can see in some of my images here the different... Um, the different archways that are there. You have the outline of the abbey in almost its, all of its entirety. So given the information that is provided there, you can get an idea and you're able to imagine the immensity of this monastery and what it would have looked like at its height in the 13th century. Now, unfortunately, because of the Dissolution Act uh, under Henry VIII, uh, the monastery didn't survive and this is how it fell into ruin. And it was um, dissolved on Christmas Eve of 1539. So Merry Christmas to you. We're going to completely uh, dissolve your monastery and good luck with your life. So after the dissolution, um, it was used for private homes and private apartments. And then unfortunately, it, it was demolished. So Fortunately, apart from um, the some of the uh, wall paintings that you have in Hale's Church, you also have some stained glass that was saved uh, and the tiles that I showed you as well are saved also. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this, these both locations are located right next to each other. They're about two and a half hours driving from London. And they're located uh, just outside of Winchcombe in Gloucestershire here in England. Uh, you can get there by public transport, but it's a little bit more difficult, requires some trains, planes, automobiles, and buses. So if you are able to get there by car, I highly recommend it. So you'll find at the uh, bottom here in the description, a link to the English Heritage site, which will show you uh, when you can visit and uh, give you some more suggestions about visiting both of these locations. And um, I also have a, a link just to some different images that you can see from the church as well. So thank you for joining me for the third episode this week. As always, at the bottom in the description, I will have the different links to different information that was mentioned during this episode. And I look forward to catching up with you again next week.